Welcome to Bamford Rose and another question of the week. This week I have a chat with Steve over at Aston 1936. Aston 1936 website and YouTube channel is a great resource for Aston owners over in the States. In the coming weeks, Steve and I hope to have a few more chats. So I hope you enjoy this one and check back soon for more content with Steve over at Aston 1936. So hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Hi, no problem. So let me start. I'm just going to jump right in. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about your history with Aston Martin. You've let it slip in a couple of your um, videos that I've watched that you used to work for Aston. So I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, what did you actually do at Aston Martin? Uh, yeah, I was performance development and calibration engineer on Aston Martin V8 and V12 engines. You know, I originally started my career for Rover Group, uh, which turned into being merged with BMW before BMW sank it down the toilet. And f f for Rover, uh, I was performance development engineer uh, and uh, drivability calibration engineer on um, Rover 200, 400, 600, 800, MGF, uh, a little bit on Range Rover, Freelander, and then f for a considerable period of time on New Mini. So this would have been the Mini that came out in uh, 2000 and uh, in that naturally aspirated and supercharged form. Then when that project was finished, uh, I started at Aston in 2002 and worked there until uh, 2010, 11. And uh, yeah, did all of the performance development and drivability calibration on 4.3 V8, 4.7 uh, DB9, which turned into V12 Vantage DBS. And before I left, I'd done a load of research work on prototype um, 565 V12 motor, which was in the new Vanquish and then V12 BS. Uh, when I started there, we were just finishing off uh, DB7 GT and did a little bit on Vanquish S. So fortunately, I worked on all those projects in quite a short space of time. Wow, that is a lot of uh, interesting topics. I'm I have I have a mini Cooper S. I've got the supercharged version of something you've worked on. I've, and uh, as most of my viewers know, I've got a the V12. So I'm um, driving around in a lot of your work already. Thank you for doing that. Um, are you uh, an engineer by schooling, or how did you fall into the the, the job at Aston? Um, at Aston, it uh, was essentially headhunted, um, but that was because the management team that were putting together Aston's powertrain team sort of stemmed from Rover. Sort of in their heyday in, in sort of late 80s, 90s, Rover was a huge empire, em employed many thousands of people. So when Rover uh, sort of disbanded, management team went to the four corners of the, the globe. And you can find still today quite a few of those people uh, in very senior positions at, at a lot of car companies. Uh, so where it all started uh, at Rover was uh, Rover apprenticeship, engineering apprenticeship. And I remember being 16 and going into a hall where about 50 other lads were doing a whole sort of test day. And there were lots of different question papers on mechanical principles and English and maths and, and a load of stuff like that probably took about four hours and the personnel guy uh, after the, the day was finished said well okay uh, if you we're going to probably take on about uh, 10 apprentices from this this intake and if you hear something from us uh, within two weeks, then that's good news. If you don't hear from us uh, within two weeks, take that as a as a dear John. Uh, apart from four people that I'd like to stay behind now. And it was uh, my name got read out and I thought, oh, this is going to be some guy telling me, come on, you're, you're just having a joke. You know, you need to not apply for this sort of job. Uh, but anyway, uh, everyone went. And the guy said to us, well, right, um, you know, there, there'll be a follow up second interview for the, for other people uh, whilst they go through the employment process. But you four will give an engineering apprenticeship to immediately. Oh, wow. So I was, I was pretty surprised about that. That's terrific. Uh, so I 
in my interviews, I thought I'd probably fluffed it in my interviews because uh, they're asking the normal questions about, uh, right, what do you want to do in the car industry? And and I said, look, because I knew it was pretty common for apprentices to go in every single department, crash, brake, suspension, and everything like that. And I said, I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in engines. So employ me if you're going to put me into the engine section. If you're not, don't bother because uh, because that's all I want to do and um, you know I was at that age 16 I was taking apart my motorbikes and putting them back together and making them go faster without really knowing what I was doing but it seemed to work uh, and didn't go wrong too often <laughs> uh, so you know engines was my thing and um, after a, a, a follow-up interview and I remember one guy saying right well that's it you, you've got your apprenticeship you're in uh, engine section and, and they said you know you're happy and I thought well I nearly fluffed it at that point I said yeah uh, uh, it, I'd, I'd be extra special happy if it was for Yamaha Suzuki Honda or Kawasaki but Rover will, Rover will do. Uh, well I guess we have to start somewhere right <laughs> Well, let me let me move on and ask you then about um, how you started Bamford Rose. So, uh, what's sort of the origin story there? Obviously, you must have you've left Aston, and you decided to start your own shop, or what was the motivation there? When we were finishing off Mini, at that point, BMW didn't have any Mini dealerships to sell the cars from. Uh, that Rover had been finished, so we knew it weren't going to be sold from Rover dealerships but the mini standalone dealerships hadn't sprung up. They hadn't been created. And there was a few of us in engineer and the mechanics that had been working on that car for like five years. And we knew the car inside out, back to front. And we were going to start a, a mini garage. You know, we could upgrade those cars quite easily and work on them quite easily. But BMW sold them with like a three or five year service package. And when we found that out and they were going to do the standalone dealerships, then that sort of put that idea to bed. Uh, and then uh, the, the opportunity at Aston came along. And back then, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Aston was part of Ford. There was a lot of money being invested into Aston, two new models. And, you know, it was absolutely perfect. So once I started working at Aston, the idea of doing anything uh, independent off my own back like that just disappeared because I was working for you know, a great company. It was a great job. I really, really enjoyed those early years. But then as the years progressed, you could see in the UK that they were selling a good couple of thousand units per annum, but there were no independent specialists, only franchise dealers. You know, there were lots of independent specialists for the heritage cars, but nothing for the new era cars. And that sort of reignited the idea of, oh, OK, you know, there's there's an opportunity here. And then when Ford sold Aston during that 08 sort of economic crash and uh, Aston went in the hands of a sort of private equity group headed up by uh, Dave Richards, the chairman of ProDrive. I sort of knew then that they're not going to have the, the R&D budget to keep uh, sort of like my job going. You know, maybe in the future they copy and paste engines from another place, which is ultimately what they're doing now. And I worked on about four programs that ended up getting cancelled. Um, you know, one of them was a fully functioning V12 GDI engine, which which got cancelled. Wow. So a, a, after that, and and seeing that you know, as Aston's direction wasn't as safe as what it was in the Ford days, and in the UK there being no independent specialist, that was sort of like the the trigger to to pluck up enough courage to to start up and go it alone oh wow so what year was that that you started Bamford Rose uh, we started in uh, early 11 so early 11 so uh, DB9 had been out a while the Vantage was out and the DBS was out uh, had the Vanquish come out yet I'm trying to uh, no um, Vantage S uh, so um, V8 420 horsepower Vantage S that that wasn't released we just finished that so all that was in production we, when we started Bamford Rose was uh, V8 Vantage 4.3, 4.7. Uh, DB9, 
and the 470 horsepower version of DB9 and 510 horsepower V12 Vantage in DB9. Oh. Uh, sorry, V12 Vantage and DBS, but, but that was it. How big is your team at uh, Bamford Rose right now? Uh, we're, we're about eight of us. We've got dedicated on-site uh, paint shops. So we've got paint shop technician. We make our own, most of our own upgrade kits. So we're a fabrication shop, uh, me in the office, and then uh, the rest of the guys in the vehicle workshop. So that's terrific. And man, I, uh, I wish we had a shop like Bamford Rose. I'm over here in West Coast of uh, the United States, and uh, we don't have specialists like you here. So um, uh, for those of you watching from the UK, this is a, you have a terrific resource nearby. All right, so I wanted to ask you a few questions about, you know, you're a business owner, you're a professional mechanic essentially at this point as well. Um, there's always one of those stories that you'd be willing to tell over a, a couple of whiskeys. You know, what's the biggest type of whoops you've ever seen in the shop or in the test cell at Aston or someplace? But I, I think the biggest whoops moment inside Bamford Rose Workshop, I, I honestly can't think of anything. Um, it's probably because we're all a bit uh, old and a bit grey and we've made those mistakes in uh, previous walks of life. But in previous walks of life, yeah, there's been quite a few whoops moments. I mean, if, you're, if you've got an engine on a dyno and you're doing a power curve and you're at peak power speed, 7,000 RPM, and you're trying to dial in spark, fuel, uh, cam timing, everything all really, really quickly, uh, that you're gonna have sausage fingers one day and you're gonna type in the wrong spark value and it, it will run it and the engine will catapult itself uh, across the, the, the dyno room. That's happened. So you've watched, you've uh, basically been behind the bulletproof glass and watched an engine go before on the yeah. dyno? Oh, wow. Many, many times. Yeah. Um, so I, I had another question. So also meant to be a little bit silly, but, you know, I, I work in a service industry, but um, I'm wondering, do you have any sort of pet peeves about owners, you know, uh, behavior or a question that you hear all the time that, you know, man, if I hear that again, I'm going to go crazy. Uh, I think at Bamford Rose, we're re really lucky because I think the sort of customer that we attract wants to look after their own car in the way that we want to look after it. Um, so so um, the, 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 only, the only sort of peeve that, that, that can happen is when someone has a problem with a car and they downplay it at the point of booking it in or handing the keys over thinking that that is going to make sort it of cheaper. yeah makes it cheaper and and you know when someone says oh you know i've just got it's got a little thing wrong and then actually when you start investigating it turns into something bigger okay. if if we'd have just been told at the start everything it would have actually made uh diagnosis or finding the fault a lot quicker and a lot easier no. but uh i i think you know, you're getting onto a bit of a bigger subject, but especially in the UK, um, the garage world hasn't got the best of reputations. And there's lots of stories of people being had over by garages. And, you know, we, we do a really transparent, honest job. You know, I, I really like to see customers driving away happy in their cars. We've done a good turn on their car. And, um, you know, it's, it's all been a fair, fair deal. But People can, and, and I myself in, in previous times have been ripped off by garages. So people come often to a garage with some baggage from a previous experience. And, uh, you know, that, that's not what we're about. And, and getting over that baggage is, is not annoying because I can understand why people are like it, but that, that can be difficult sometimes. Well, I, that makes sense the way you describe it. The problem is not unique to the UK. It's all over in the US as well. And, you know, I, I can see the trepidation an owner might have burying their soul when they come to you because it's, oh, they might equate it directly as to opening their wallet entirely, you know, if they um, give you the opportunity to take it all. But it sounds like you're, you know, Bamford Rose is very responsible and you treat each car like, you know, you'd want your car to be, you know, treated. And that's all, you know, I think I would look for as a, as an owner, just someone to look after my car for me 
and take care of it. And then I'm happy just to pay for whatever it takes to do that. Do you have like, you know, on that same sort of theme though, is there one recommendation you would make to all Aston owners, you know, like, Hey, if you, I could just get one point across, you know, to an owner, you know, what might that be? Um, I think so, a tip so that someone can get the best out of their ownership experience. And then uh, when, or if they choose to go to a garage, that journey is um, sort of as straightforward as it can be. Uh, I, if I was an owner, arm myself with a really, really good diagnostic tool. You know, a Foxwell is a good one. That's quite intelligent, but even some fairly cheap, unintelligent ones will just give you the basics. And whenever you have a fault code pop up on a dashboard or anything like that, plug in, uh, take a note on paper of all the codes that you've got, you know, date, mileage, what you were doing, uh, what, when the code triggered, and then just uh, jot down a, a history, a pattern. And then when you went to a garage, you'd have a series of events and, you uh, you know, the, the garage would then have a, a better clue about what's wrong with the car. And as the owner, um, you know, you'd sort of be in control of the fix. You know, no one could take you for a ride, uh, you know, making up stuff that it wasn't. Um, uh, you know, that, that that would be a good tip as, a, as an ownership experience, as, as a thing to do. Yeah, well, I agree. That's the, That was the very first tool, specialty tool I bought for my car was a uh, an OBD obd2 tool and i do have a foxwell <laughs> the reason that they're good on the v12 is that most unintelligent handheld meters are only ever going to read the primary ecu right so if you've got faults occur on the second bank of the engine it just will never read them yeah. and right. yeah the foxwell can also um not to get too nerdy but you can also talk to the other body other control modules in the car like you can plug into the body port and talk to the transmission and a few other things that I found that my generic one just couldn't do. So that's why I've, I found that the Foxwell has just been terrific for me. Yeah, I, I do advise it to a lot of owners and they get a little bit put off by the price of it because it is expensive. But the way I would view it is that it's a purchase that you make for your whole driving career. You know, that's going to go from car to car to car and uh, it's, it's a, a good investment. All right. Well, I'm interested to figure out what Mike likes. And uh, my first question is, what's your daily driver? What do you get to work, you know, to and from work in? Uh, well, you'd probably be better off uh, asking me, uh, I said earlier, when I mentioned some motorbike manufacturers, what, uh, what do you what ride? I like to ride? What do you uh, ride to work in back then? Uh, I'm into my motorbikes. I'm into my aeroplanes. Uh, but to answer very quickly, I love to drive cars that I used to work on. And at this moment in time, I drove. I drive a Rover 220 Turbo. It's a coupe. Uh, it's quite a rare car. It probably means absolutely nothing to anyone in the States. Uh, but it's one of the very first projects I worked on. And uh, it, it's important to me, that car. So it's kind of fun to drive that now, sort of like over 20 years on. Because Rovers are complete rock boxes. So there are none of them left on the road. And now this car is pretty rare and exclusive. Um, it was always a quick car. You know, it was not, it was faster not to 60 than the uh, VW Golf GTI in the day. And it wasn't too far off an Escort Cosworth. Oh, wow. There was a one, there was a one make race series for a 220 turbo. Uh, so they've got, um, they've got a bit of presence and, you know, if you fill up at a petrol station, then someone always comments uh, on the car. Normally, they're surprised that it's still running because it's got a Rover engine in it. But uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that, that I like to drive something that's really rare, you know, and, and uh, 20 years ago, driving that 220 Turbo Rover wouldn't have been rare. Uh, it is today because it's rare that it's not uh, rotted back to uh, to join the earth. <laughs> that's cool. Oh. Um, motorbikes, I'm absolutely fanatical about the mid 80s, uh, early 90s, 500cc two stroke Grand Prix era. Um, so Eddie Lawson, Kevin Swans, Wayne Rainey, uh, all of that era of uh, uh, motorbike racing. Um, you know, I don't watch uh, current GP. Uh, I will just 
look on YouTube of uh, GP races in, in the 80s. So I've got a few of those bikes of my own. Um, I've got uh, a few Suzuki RG500s, uh, two-stroke 500cc Grand Prix rep. And, uh, yeah, I, I love those bikes to pieces. And then, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I fly airplanes uh, in uh, mid 90s. I got my first pilot's license. This was for ultralights. And oh, then, wow. yeah, so basically a hang glider with, uh, with a motor on a trike hanging <laughs> off it. Yeah, that's an ultralight. Mm, I'm seeing sort of a risk factor that, uh, uh, in your lifestyle. So if you need to get your car serviced at Bamford Rose, hurry. Um, and then in 2015, I got a uh, general aviation pilot's license. So now I can combine two things that I love the most. Uh, every year I fly uh, to the Isle of Man TT. So I, I leave the middle of the UK at about six o'clock in the morning, get to the Isle of Man for about eight o'clock. I've got a taxi booked, takes me to the corner where I'm going to watch the TT, then come back to the airfield get home in time for about nine o'clock when the highlights are on the TV. <laughs> and maybe put yourself on the corner or something. I've done that. I've done that before. I've watched from the rear view camera of, uh, it was Michael Dunlop on, on one of his TT bikes and it was on his rear view camera. And uh, you can watch back at me pointing a camera phone at his bike. <laughs> so uh, Mike, if you had a, um, let's just say like, well, maybe a 2005 DB9 coupe uh, in Merlot red, uh, not like me, but uh, if you had a bone stock DB9, wow, well, what would you do if it was your car? What would be, you know, what kind of things might you do to it at all? Anything? Totally standard. And if you just wanted to leave the UK, maybe go down to South of Spain in it, um, that's a great Grand Tourer out of the box. And, and you know, apart from servicing it well so it didn't uh, bite you with any problems, then uh, out of the box, they're, they're really, really great cars. And, and if you remember um, back in to 2005 when that car came out, Aston could do no wrong. You know, that DB9 was uh, Jeremy Clarkson's. Favorite bike. Uh, it was uh, so cool. It was in the fridge. It was sub-zero, you know. Uh, out of the box, if you just want a Grand Tourer, totally fine. Uh, or if you wanted to, um, you know, use the car a bit more spiritedly uh, on, on some country roads on a Sunday afternoon, then you haven't got to do too much to improve brakes, suspension, engine performance. And, and then that car's quite rewarding. So you juice it up a little bit, you know, uh, uh, make the suspension. You know, I know you've done a, uh, videos in the past about, you know, maybe upgrading the suspension to the newer um, Bilstein dampers to make it a little, a, a little bit better a ride. Um, and, uh, you know, if that might do, would you do anything with the tires or anything like that? Or, you know, do you have any other basic things that you would tackle with a DB9 to upgrade it? Yeah. So um, we always fit Michelin Pilot Sports on the DB9 now, and that just transforms the car, the ride, the comfort, uh, just cabin composure uh, compared to the Bridgestones. So, so that's one thing. The next really cool and easy and quick thing to do uh, would be to DB9 Valente. If you look at uh, an early DB9 Valente, they were built without a rear roll bar. Oh, yeah. So all you have to do is retrofit a roll bar from DB9 Coupe onto the Valente, and you've just improved your handling and drive experience of the Valente no end. Yeah. Oh. And that's very, well, relatively speaking, that's a very simple thing to install and a fairly inexpensive part too. Yep. I, UK prices, the roll bar is about 180 pounds. You've got a bracket, some bushes, and pretty much uh, two anti-roll bar drop link, link arms and put that kit on and away you go. That's a huge improvement, real quick, real, real easy. Oh, that'd be a great upgrade for the Volante folks. 
right? Well, I have a, a rapid fire and I'm gonna actually pull up my list of questions here, my rapid fire round where I wanted to, um, you know, ask you some stuff that uh, uh, sort of quick, you know, yes, no, <laughs> one way or another type things. And you just answered one of them because the very first rapid fire question was, OEM or Michelin Pilot Sport 4S, yes or no? Well, obviously, you're a, it's a yes for the uh, Michelin Pilot Sport 4S. Carbon brakes or steel brakes? What's best for somebody that isn't trying to do a track car? Uh, steel. Uh, brake caliper bolts, are they reusable or not? Yes. On the body finish, paint protection film, uh, is it worth it or not worth it? If you've just painted the car, it's worth it. If you have already got some stone chips, not worth it because it would just amplify the visual. Um... It looks crappy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you were going to keep the car, definitely paint it, definitely protective film it. If you weren't going to keep the car, just let the stone rashing deteriorate the car a bit and then sell it. Ceramic coating, yes or no? No. Favorite color for a DB9? Uh, I, I just think DB9 is classic and understated and they look really well in something like quantum silver or, or, or something like that. Uh, I like color art. So if you've got a striking interior, exterior color combo, I quite like that. Uh, another quick question. So you're storing a car for the winter, gas tank empty or full? Uh, full, but without any ethanol in the petrol. So how about your favorite car related TV show? I'm not going to go with one of the car mags or anything like that. Um, I am going to pick Death Proof by Tarantino. Death Proof by Tarantino. Okay. I wasn't expecting that one. What's your most favorite Aston Martin that you've ever driven? Uh, oh, can I cheat and answer that three ways? Yep, go for it. Uh, first, the favorite Aston I've never driven will be a db4 zagato okay i so badly want to drive one of those cars uh, just for a day and take it on a tour uh, the next favorite aston i have driven is a customer car of ours which is a v12 zagato absolutely love that car it, it's it is a normal v12 vantage under the skin but with the interior with the exterior looks it does transform it and and you can't help but feel very special when you drive that car it, it's it's awesome um i'm not normally a, a green car fan but this car is in british racing green with a classic sandstone interior and that color combo just works and it's just absolutely gorgeous and a delight to drive uh third is uh it's something a bit different. Instead of a uh, favorite Aston to drive, uh, being a development engineer, I get a real kick out of this in that I've been the first person ever on a dyno to start a few engines. So first person ever to start a 4.3 engine, first person ever to start a 4.7 engine, first person ever to start a 177 engine, Oh, wow. And in, pro in prototype, first person ever to start the V12 V DBS 510 horsepower and first person ever to start a 565 Vanquish variable cam time engine. I really get a kick out of being a prototype engineer. And you know, you're the first person ever to press the start button on that particular engine. That, that, I really enjoy that. I bet you you had a big smile on your face when they fire off. Uh, yeah, it's it's just that because it's your job, it it's sort of a, a non-event. You know, it's not it's not special. But then when you look back at it, it was. You know. Well, that is super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that, to be able to look back on your life experience and know that those are all moments that were part of it. That's you know, that's priceless. As is you know the the future. And um, I'm. I'm interested to know, you know, what do you have in store for Bamford Rose and uh, in the years ahead? You know, obviously, uh, you've been working on your social media and sharing information with us, but well, you know, what's what's up next for Bamford Rose itself? Obviously, we're in the UK and uh, we've grown our customer base over the last ten years, and we've got you know a fairly decent reputation in in the Aston world. So, you know, much of the same uh, as going forward as what we've done over the last few years. Uh, if I was going to uh, dream of something, then, you know, maybe Bamford Rose starts up a franchise somewhere else. 
back in 05 to 08, uh, Aston sales were 30% UK, 30% States, 30% Germany, and then 10% uh, rest of the world. So, you know, in the States, there's an awful lot of cars driving around. It's just they're driving around in such a big land mass area. But um, it's it's really tough to start up a business venture in a different country uh, and probably unlikely to happen. Well, if it happens, you know, someplace in California would be terrific. Someplace that I could at least get my car to you would be be nice. Well, Mike, I should let you go. I want to thank you for giving uh, me so much of your time so generously. And uh, I look forward to having a chance to do something like this again in the future. Yeah, well, it'd be really great to turn the tables and uh, we can let all the Bamford Rose viewers uh, see the real good work that you've done on your channel and your website. There's some real technical insights uh, to the DB9 and Aston cars uh, in general on there. And it'd be great to dig into that a bit deeper. Well, I look forward to maybe having a chance to do that. Um, so I'd like to remind all of you out there to uh, please check out the Bamford Rose uh, YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, Mike does his weekly forum chats where he talks about all things uh, Aston and shares his insights um, and, uh, and his knowledge with you. I really like those because he tells it like it is and he knows what he's talking about. I hope you enjoyed this video and as always, thanks for watching.